Okay, folks, so what we're going to start off with today is actually something that I laid the foundations for in the last class, which was to talk about implied equity risk premiums. Remember the little exercise we did where I said, how much would you pay for a dollar with certainty for the next forever? And you gave me a number. And then I took the same dollar and said, what if this dollar were uncertain? And I said, how much would you pay? And you all pretty much got the intuition that you would pay less for a risky expected dollar. That's called risk aversion. We've known about it for 400 years. And in fact, the basis for risk aversion was an experiment that a guy called Daniel Bernoulli ran 400 years ago, where he offered people a guaranteed cash flow and an, and an uncertain cash flow, and so you got different answers. So we know people are risk averse. That's a given. The question is, how much of a premium are you going to charge? And I said, look at what people pay, not what they say. So if I ask you, what's your risk premium? You can give me a number, right? 5%, 8%, 10%, 15%. There's nothing behind the number. That's why if you see somebody on CNBC being asked, what do you think the equity risk premium for the market is? And they say 6%. Take it about five seconds and drop it into the trash can because it means absolutely nothing until I see what you pay. So every, at the start of every month, as I said, I tried to do this for the S&P 500. I'll describe the process a little more in detail today, but I want to lay out the intuition by showing you what the numbers look like this morning. Let me explain what I mean by the numbers look like. This morning, when I looked at the S&P 500, the start of trading today it was 2139.76. What does that tell me? That's what you're willing to pay for the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US, right? With all the concerns you have about the Fed raising rates, about global economy slowing, I don't care all the storytelling at the end of the process saying, this is what I'm willing to pay. I know what the S&P 500 had as earnings over the last 12 months. I would know what they generated as cash flows. And in a sense, I also know what you guys collectively think about future growth, even though individually you might have different estimates, by looking at what people are projecting as growth and earnings for the next five years. I also know what your alternative is right now. You could put your money in T-bond rates and make what? Not 4% normalized, but 4.5%. 
1.69%. Again, we can bitch and moan about how low that number is, how unfair it is, how the Fed is responsible for it. But at the end of the process, that's what I can make from something risk-free. So remember how we compute yield to maturity on a bond, right? Take the price, you take the cash flows, you solve for that discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows equal to the price of the bond. I do that with the S&P 500. I, say, I know the price, 2139. And if you go down a little bit on the spreadsheet, and you can get, the, I'll, I'll send you the link, but you can also pull it off. I projected out my cash flows for the next five years. So basically, you can see cash flow from the last 12 months projected out using the market's own judgments of growth. So I don't want to impose my growth rates. So basically, this is what the market's expecting as growth. This is what it's paying for those cash flows. And I have the cash flows. I have the price you're willing to pay for the S&P 500. I have your cash flows going forward. And I've got to do a little trickery at the end because cash flows keep going forever and I can't project cash flows forever. So I assume a perpetual growth model. And then I ask the same question I asked with a bond. What discount rate would I need to make the present value of my cash flows from the S&P 500 equal to what you paid today? You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to figure out what, given what you paid, what your expected return has to be. And this morning when I did it, this is what the number looked like. Okay. It was 8.83%. You say, why is it 6.14? 8.83% is what I can, I'm sorry, 7.83% is what I can make on stocks. If I subtract out the 1.69%, I end up with a risk premium of 6.14% based on what you're paying for stocks. So I'm taking what you pay for stocks, backing out your expected return based on the cash flow, 7.83%, subtracting out the T-bond rate, and I have your equity risk premium as of right now at 6.14%. Could that change by the end of the day? Of all the numbers I've used in my calculation, which is the most volatile number? Earnings can change, but they don't change dramatically in one minute or one hour. Growth rate expectations can change, but they take a while. But which of the numbers can change essentially in the next five minutes? The S&P 500 can drop by 10%. It can go up by 10%. It, so you can have markets move. And guess what? Every time markets move, equity risk premiums are changing. And they change in the right direction. Let me explain why. You have a crisis somewhere, China. The S&P 500 drops 10%. If the S&P, holding all that's constant, if I keep my cash flows the same, and I drop the S&P 500 by 10%, What's going to happen to my equity risk premium? Is it going to go up or go down? Think bond price and interest rates, and the answer will come through, right? When interest rates go up, what happens to bond prices? They go down. When the index goes down, holding all its constant means your expected return has gone up, your equity. And that actually makes sense, right? Because in a crisis, what's happening to you? You're getting more terrified. And when you're getting more terrified, guess what? You demand a larger risk premium, not a smaller one. So if the index drops by 10%, holding all else constant, the equity risk premium is going to go up. Hang in there with me. Let's suppose the index drops 10% over the next three months. You think this is awful. Let's also assume earnings drop by 10% over the next three months. So now the markets come down, but so has your base earnings and cash flow. I compute, and let's assume the risk free rate hasn't changed. What's going to happen to my equity risk premium if both the index and earnings have come down by 10%? I have lower prices, right? So that's pushing the equity risk premium higher. But I also have lower cash flows, which is pushing in the other direction. They're going to offset each other. So what I'm trying to say is stocks go down. That by itself doesn't mean equity risk premiums are going to go up. If stocks go down and earnings go down, your equity risk premium could be unchanged. It's how much stocks move relative to earnings that drive the equity risk premium up or down. So stock prices go down, equity risk premium goes 
Cash flows come down, equity risk premium comes down. Let's finish the story. There's all this talk about what's going to happen in early November when the Federal Open Market Committee meets, right? Let's go into this vacuum where the only thing that changes is let's assume the Fed acts and interest rates go up, but everything else remains as is. Same S&P 500, same earnings, same cash flows. If I hold everything else constant and I raise my risk-free rate, what's going to happen to my equity risk premium? It's pure math, right? What do I do? I compute the internal rate of return for stocks and I subtract out the risk-free rate, right? So if I hold everything else constant, I have a higher risk-free rate, my risk premium is going to come down. Now what if rates go up and stock prices come down? Because that's the story you're usually told, right? That's a scary story. Then what's going to happen to risk premiums? The risk-free rate has gone up. So that's going to push the risk premium down. But if stocks go down, what happens to risk premiums? They go up. You could actually wake up the day after with rates at 2.5%, stock prices down, and risk premiums could remain unchanged. You're saying, this is a nightmare. Get used to it. Risk premiums change constantly. It's your job and my job to make sure we use updated numbers. And one of the things I'm going to argue for is the old days where you used 4% and you kept using it for 20 years because that's what you've always used. You got to let go. Maybe that worked in the US market in the last century. It no longer works now. So it's a very simple extension of what we do in bonds into stocks. Now, you can take issue with my numbers. You can say, well, your cash flows are wrong, you're, and I'm fine with that. So in fact, I let you pick variants of what I did. So you want to normalize the cash flows? Be my guest. If you think that analyst estimates of growth are bad and you want to use some other estimate of growth, go ahead. But as long as you play on this turf, guess what? Your equity risk premium is not going to be that different from mine. Remember we talked about the standard error and historical risk premiums being plus or minus 2.29%? The standard error on an implied equity risk premium, allowing for the fact that your cash flows and growth rates can be different, is at best going to be plus or minus 0.5%. The range we're going to get, I get 6.16%, 6.14%. The range you're going to get is between 5 and 7 you're not going to get three, you're not going to get nine. There's no way you can even get to those numbers with the market being where it is today. So you get a much tighter range and you get an updated number. This to me is a no contest. Why would I take a stale number with a big standard error when I can get an updated number with a much smaller standard error? So as I said, we'll dig on this because I'll start off by showing you what the number looked like at the start of 2008 and then again at the end of 2008. At, at the end of 2008, after the crisis, so you can see the basis for why the world is the way it is today, of shifting risk premiums and shifting stock prices. So let's close this, and I'll send you, as I said, I'll send you the Excel spreadsheet, and you can play with it. And go back to the page I left you with. So is it page 57, I think, is where we were. where I showed you the equity risk premium for Coca-Cola. Remember that? I took the weighted average by region. So why, why, you don't even have to remember. That's the page I used. And I told you why I used revenues. And it was actually a very lazy reason. I said I use revenues because revenues is the one number that I know I can find for pretty much every company. And I said, I don't trust EBITDA. I don't trust EBIT, so I'm going to go with revenues. And nine times out of 10, I have no qualms about using revenues as my basis for computing equity risk premiums. But I'll admit, it's kind of narrow, right? Because I'm missing a lot of other risks you can be exposed to, even though your revenues might be coming outside the country. I'll take the example of Embraer. If you remember, Embraer got 3% of its revenues in Brazil and 97% in the US and Europe. And I said, therefore, Embraer is not very exposed to Brazilian country risk. I've actually exposed a weakness in my approach, right? What's the problem with that statement that I just made? They get 97% of their revenues outside Brazil. That's true. But where do they make all their aircraft? It's in factories in Brazil. 
If Brazil goes to hell in a handbasket, oh, well, guess what? You're still going to be affected even though your revenues are outside. So the focus on revenues can be dangerous for some companies, especially if you have big infrastructure investments, factories. You know who's worst affected? What if I told you the Nigerian oil company has no exposure to Nigerian country risk because it sells 95% of its oil into a global oil market? It's absurd, right? You're saying, I sell into a global oil market, but I'm, all my reserves are in Nigeria. It's not like I can pull them up and take them somewhere else if I'm not happy with what's going on. So I'm going to first talk about what to do about companies, especially natural resource companies, where revenues might not capture my exposure to risk. The other is I'm trusting beta to carry a lot of weight, right? So in the second approach, if you remember, once I get the equity risk premium, I say if you have a high beta, you're more exposed to country risk. If you have a low beta, you're less exposed. And that might or might not be true. So let me take each of these weaknesses and talk a little bit about how I would try to confront them. So a few months ago, I was valuing Royal Dutch. Royal Dutch, as you know, it's a huge oil company with multiple heads. You know, it's trade in the Netherlands, it's trade in London. I'm not even sure which company you're actually dealing with at any point in time. But an immense oil company. And if you look at oil company revenues, they don't even try to break it down by region because, as I said, commodities often get sell sold into a global market and different countries get it out of the global market. So at first sight, you're saying, well, Royal Dutch you know, it's a, it's a, it gets most of its revenues all over the world, so I'll use a global risk premium. But if you open up the Royal Dutch Annual Report, they actually have a global a, a picture of where their reserves are in the world. Take a look at that map. It's like looking at a heat map of every part of the world you don't want to be in. There's something about oil. I think this is God's way of punishing you while giving you a gift. Here, you can have oil. And now guess what? The rest of your future is ruined. So if you look at Royal Dutch's reserves, they're actually in the most risky parts of the world. So when I sat down to value Royal Dutch, I had a choice. I could go with revenues and take a pretty sanguine view of country risk and use a global risk premium. But to me, that made no sense because they actually told me where the reserves were. And I had the equity risk premiums for each of these countries. I took a weighted average based on reserves. So here I went entirely with where your production and reserves are as opposed to the Coca-Cola where I went entirely with revenues. Now, can you split the difference? Can you bring both into it? I don't see why not. Let's say you're in a company where you say, well, revenues matter and production matters. Why not bring both in? You're saying, what weight should I use? Make your best judgments. Better than what people are doing right now. So what if you did 50-50 weights, 60-40 weights? It's not going to immensely affect your valuation, but make your best judgment. The key word is judgment. I can't give you a little magic bullet that says, oh, you got the right answer. I don't know what the right answer is. Make your best judgment. So look at revenues, but if you are concerned about production and where re reserves are, bring that into the analysis as well. Any questions? Yes. No, actually, I'm not bringing them down, right? Because what happens is this goes into my discount rate. Yeah. As a proactive, forward-looking risk premium, those reserves are there. So when I do growth and cash flows, I'm bring. So in a sense, I'm balancing out the fact that if I don't do this, I'm acting like they can draw on these reserves and get the cash flows. Because after something happens and you lose the reserves, it's off the board. So the, when they're reporting reserves, they're saying, we know we have these reserves. And as an investor, I'm looking and say, that's good. You have lots of reserves. And then I had this qualifier. But your reserves are all in Kazakhstan. I should be really worried because you might not be able to extract it. So this is why my way of saying reserves in safer parts of the world are worth more than reserves in riskier parts, even before I know something bad's going to happen. Okay. Any other questions? Now let me talk a little bit about that lambda that I talked about. Remember I told you it was a concoction. Right? So when you think about estimating lambda, what I'm trying to do is bring into that lambda things I can't capture with traditional measures. Like what? Well, let's suppose you're in risky parts of the world, but you also bought insurance against risk. That's a good thing to know. Maybe you're not as risky as I thought it was. 
Usually insurance is not that complete, but if you could, that, I'd like to know that. I'd also like to know whether you're a company that the government thinks is in the national interest. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? What happens to companies that are viewed in the national interest? Governments feel the urge to meddle all the time. To me, when I hear the term national interest, it freaks me out as an investor because I know exactly what's coming. The minister of finance for that country basically runs the company because it's in the national interest. Think of Petrobras. That's what, that, think of that as the worst case end game for what happens when a company becomes a company that's viewed in the national interest. It's asked to do things that no profit-making entity would be required to do. So you're in the national interest, go out and bribe a few million people. Now that was, that's not the exact message, but go build infrastructure where you don't have to build infrastructure. Look for reserves because that's a poor part of the country. So watch for those words, national interest, because that suggests to you that maybe your exposure to country risk just went up. Okay? So what I'm looking for is a richer measure of exposure to country risk that captures all that stuff. Some of it is fuzzy, right? It's not in the numbers, but you know there is a problem. So I started off this exercise of looking for lambdas, and I was lazy again. My first estimate of lambda was based entirely on revenues. So I'll tell you how my lambda works. Remember, it scaled around one. A lambda one means you're less exposed to country risk than the typical company in the market. So my first two, the, the first two companies I experimented with this measure on were actually Embraer and Embev, but I'm going to update it because a couple of years ago I was looking at two companies that are Indian companies. They're part of the same family group. One is called Tata Consulting Services and the other is Tata Motors. Both Indian companies both part of the same family group, and you're going to be tempted to say, they're both Indian companies, I'm going to give them the same risk premium, but here's where they're different. In 2008 and 2009, Tata Motors got 91% of its revenues in India. This was just before they bought Jaguar Land Rover, and there's a story that I want to tell that follows through. But the year before they bought Land Rover, they were an Indian company that got almost all of their revenues in India. In contrast, Tata Consulting Services got less than 8% of its revenues in India. If I just focus on revenues, I'm already seeing a picture emerge of one company getting most of its operations, revenues in India, and the other not. Now, I need to scale this, right? Because a, a lambda has to be averaged around one. So for every company that has a lambda less than one, there has to be a company with a lambda greater than one. I can't have all companies be less exposed to country risk, because then where's the country risk going? So here's what I did. I computed the average Indian company's percentage of revenues in India. This is a bit of a pain to do, because I had to go company by company. I stuck with the top 50 or 100 companies. And I essentially came up with an average of 80%. The typical Indian company gets 80% of its revenues in India. To the extent that I trust these numbers from the two Tata companies, Tata Motors gets more than the typical company, so its lambda is going to be higher than one. And Tata Consulting Services gets only 8%. Its lambda is going to be much lower than one. Very simplistic, based entirely on revenues. But you can see, essentially, I'm trying to scale the revenues to the typical company so that I can decide which companies are going to be more exposed and which are going to be less exposed. It's weak because it's based just on revenues. So I'm going to give you the second way I tried it. It's a very noisy way. I don't quite trust it myself, but it just looks good. So here's what I did. I want a richer measure of lambda. And the richer measure of lambda I can capture if I look at how your company's stock prices move as measures of country risk move. You know how we compute betas, right? We take the returns on a stock, we run a regression against a market index, we come up with the beta. If I could run a regression of returns on a stock against how country risk is behaving, if you're a company that is very exposed to country risk, small changes in country risk should translate into big changes in your returns, right? So at least when I did this the first time around, there was a dollar-denominated Brazilian bond that was traded called the C-bond. And I could get the returns every day on the C-bond. And let's face it, if you're a sovereign bond, the only real factor driving your returns on a day-to-day -day basis 
is what you, what's happening in your country. So Brazil has something bad happen, the country bond will jump, uh, will, the rate will jump up and the price will drop. So I computed the return on the country bond and the returns on the stock. In this case, the two stocks I used were Embraer, which is the aerospace company I described, and Embratel, which is the Brazilian telecom company that gets 100% of its revenues in Brazil and has really no way of getting out of that trap. So I run the regression just like a beta regression. And here's what I found. For every 1% return on the C-bond, which is a country risk measure, Embraer's returns go up by 0.26%. So when, let's say the, the country is doing well, the return is up 1%, Embraer's up only 0.26%. Stocks, uh, the country risk go, uh, increases, the, the returns go negative. Embra so Embraer is only 26% as exposed as the typical Brazilian company to movements in country risk. I did the same thing for Embratel. And the coefficient on that regression was two. For every 1% movement in the country bond, Embratel was twice as exposed. And that should come as no surprise. If you're trapped in a country and the country is being badly affected by something happening within, you're going to see your returns be much more widely no, move much more widely in response to what's happening with the country bond. So it's, a, again, a, an extension of what we do with betas. But the objective here is to come up with a lambda. So given all I said about lambdas, I'll also end with a confession. I use lambdas about once every 50 companies. I use it because I use it for companies that have exposure to one country, where I can do this. If you're Coca-Cola, see how crazy it's going to be to try to estimate lambdas for you? I'd be running 72 regressions against 72 different country bonds. I'm not even going there. So if you have a company that's exposed to 5, 6, 7, 10, 15 markets, do what I suggested. Take a weighted average the equity risk, and then let go. Multiply by the beta and keep moving on. The lambda approach is really designed for companies that have a single country exposure that you really want to be much more specific about capturing. Any questions? So you're saying, what difference it makes? Oh, we're, we're just talking about individual numbers. It can't make that much of a difference, right? Well, let's see what difference it makes depending on which approach I use. So I took Embraer in 2004 and tried to estimate. Remember, all of this is to get a cost of equity for the company. I tried to estimate the cost of equity for Embraer using each of the different approaches that I laid out. So the first approach. If I just say, look, it's a Brazilian company, therefore I'm going to add the entire Brazilian country risk premium to Embraer, I get 17.24. These are all US dollar cost of equity. The 17.24% US dollar cost of equity. If I bring it into the, bra into the brackets, I get 17 points. So when I attach the entire country risk to Embraer, I get cost of equity between 17 and 18%. If I use the finessed approach where I say Embraer is a Brazilian company but gets most of its revenues outside, whether I use the beta approach or whether I use the lambda approach, the cost of equity I get at 8, 9, at most 11%. That's a big difference in evaluation. So when I attach the entire country risk premium to the cost of equity for Embraer, I get 17%. If I adjust that for the fact that they're a Brazilian company with a big exposure outside, I get about 9 to 11%. Do you think that's going to affect your value? It's going to affect it immensely. And I want to draw a general proposition based on that. Because as I said, most valuation is still in corporation based. I'm amazed at how much people are stuck with, hey, let's use a risk premium for a company based on where it's incorporated. So let's say the rest of the world is adopting this practice. And we are the enlightened ones. Let's call it. We'll give ourselves a good name. We're the enlightened ones. So we see the light that we should be measuring equity risk premiums based on where you get revenues. So I'm going to lay out what I think is the, the basic proposition that I want you to think about. Okay. So everybody's using country. So what kinds of companies do you think are going to look undervalued to you and I? So when I go to Brazil and I look for cheap companies, if everybody else is attaching the Brazilian risk premium to every Brazilian company, as an investor who brings this fresh insight in, what companies are going to look cheap to you? Com companies that have significant exposure outside Brazil or significant exposure within Brazil? 
You want cheap companies, right? Cheap companies are companies that you think are being underpriced. If the rest of the world is attaching a constant risk premium like I did to Embraer and giving them a 17% cost of equity, companies like Embraer are going to be really cheap if you bring a different perspective. So we're the enlightened ones. We're enlightened ones with faith. So what do we do next? We buy the shares in Embraer and companies like Embraer. Have we made any money yet? No. So here comes the problem. If the rest of the world continues to do what it does, we're kind of screwed, right? Because they could be doing something irrational, and they could keep doing something irrational. So what is the reality check that you think will happen that will allow you and I to make money? Because there has to be an underlying. This can't be all a perception game. What is it that will happen in the marketplace? Or what is it that you're going to see from these companies that's going to start to make these people at least aware that they're being unfair to the companies like Embraer? Yep. Like I'm sorry? Uh, like earnings going up higher. Well, the, it has to be earnings going up higher for an Embraer in a period where Brazil is doing well or badly. If you see these companies continuing to report good earnings while the country is going up and down, at some point in time, investors are going to stop and say, it's a Brazilian company, but its earnings don't seem to have anything to do with who's running Brazil or how well or badly we're doing. Therefore, we must be screwing up. And perhaps then they will see the light. You think, when will that happen? I have absolutely no idea. But I have a very simple rule that I use in my investing. I've made a list of about 30 emerging markets and two companies like Embraer in each of these markets. So in Brazil, I can pick the Embraers of the world and perhaps a couple of other companies that get a big chunk of revenues outside Brazil. In India, I'll pick companies like TCS and Infosys, which are companies. And here's what I watch for. I watch for a crisis. I think, what if there's no crisis? Come on, it's an emerging market. There will be a crisis. And when there's a crisis, guess what will happen? Foreign institutional investors who are the ultimate sheep will all look at each other and say, we have to get out of here. And they will sell everything. Right? They don't, they're not selective about what they sell. They just want to get out of the country. That's when you should be waiting at the exit door saying, can I have your Embraer, please? Can I have your TCS, please? This is the moment where you're going to be able to get your best bargains. So if you get a chance, take a look at maybe 15 or 20 emerging. If you want to stay within a region and do just Latin America, take the you know, Latin American countries, pick one or two companies in each country that fit these characteristics. What are those characteristics? They get the bulk of their revenues outside that country, and they're not natural resource companies. So for God's sake, don't put all your money in the Venezuelan oil company. You can't even do that. It's not publicly traded. Okay? You want to make sure that these are companies that in a sense are likely exposed to country risk, but are being punished because the country is in trouble. So that's part of the reason I picked San Miguel. There will be another crisis in Argentina, I know, sooner rather than later. And people are going to sell San Miguel, even though it gets 89% of its revenues from selling lemons in the rest of the world. You know why they have such a big market? Because they have the, they have the advantage of geography. They're in the southern hemisphere. So they can grow lemons when the rest of the world is in winter. So that's not going to change. It's not like Argentina is a crisis. It moves into the northern hemisphere. But there will be people who just sell everything and move on. And those are the times where you can find, I think, your biggest bargains. So any questions on country risk? So let's close. This, this process by bringing in implied equity risk premiums. As I said, the intuition behind implied equity risk premiums is a very simple one. When you tell me how much you pay for something and I have your expected cash flows, you don't need to tell me what your expected return is because I can back it out of what you pay. And that's effectively what I'm translating the S&P 500, though it's a little messier than doing a bond because I have to estimate the cash flows and I have to deal with the fact that stocks last forever. So I'm going to take you back in time to January 2008, because I've been doing this on my website since 92, 93. And I actually have back done it through 60, even though I'm not, not on my website, but I've gone back and acted like I had the date at the start of 60, 61, 62. So I'll show you that entire graph. At the start of 2008, here's what the world looked like. 
the S&P 500 was at 1,468.36. Okay. The cash flows coming in were about 4% of the index, so basically 59.03. So I know what you paid. I know the cash flow from last year. That's pretty much all I know. I get an expected growth rate by looking at what our analysts were projections. Start of 2008, they were projecting a 5% growth rate a year. So I take the 59.03, grow it at 5% for the next five years. But I know I can't keep doing this too long because these are the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US. They can't keep growing at a rate faster than the economy. So the end of five years, I stop the game and I say, I'm going to make them grow at the same rate as the economy. And I'm going to make an assumption that I'm going to draw on repeatedly through this class. Whenever I have to estimate a nominal growth rate for the economy, I'm going to draw on that fundamental risk-free rate calculation that I showed you, that the risk-free rate is expected inflation plus a expected real interest rate. And I'm going to argue that the best proxy you have for long-term nominal growth in your economy is the risk-free rate. Start of 2008, that number was 4.02%. That was the T-bond rate. So for the next five years, our 5% growth, and then after year five, the growth drops to 4.02%, all in nominal US dollar terms. I have everything I need. I have the cash flow. I have my expected, I'm sorry, I have, the, I have the, what you paid for the index. I have the expected cash flows for the next five years. And beyond the fifth year, since I'm going to be growing at a constant year forever, a constant growth rate forever, 4.02%, there's my present value of cash flows beyond year five. Think of that as your price appreciation portion from investing in stocks. I discount those cash flows back, and I try different discount rates. What I'm solving for is what discount rate makes the present value of these cash flows equal to 1468.36. The number in 2007 was 8.39% at the end of 2007. You subtract out the T-bond rate. The implied equity risk premium at the start of 2008 was 8.39 minus 4.02, which is 4.37%. So I put that away and I started using it. And until 2008, I used to compute the implied premium for the US once every year and use it through the entire year. And my defense was the US is a mature market. How much can equity risk premiums change? in a year. The gods are always waiting for you to ask this question because then, then let, they let you know. In 2008, starting in September 2008, of course, you had the crisis. So in January 2009, when I recomputed the implied equity risk for the S&P 500, let's see what had changed. The 1468.36 had dropped to 903. That's what a crisis does, right? It wiped out 40% of stocks. Cash flows had decreased from 59 to 54, but they dropped by only about 10%. Growth rates had become a little lower, 4% of this lower base. But with that new level of the index, the new cash flows, and a growth rate forever now that's come down because the risk-free rate had come down, people's expectations had come down, the expected return I got for stocks was 8.64%. Same thing I did at the start of 2008, at the end of 2009. You subtract out the risk free rate, the implied equity risk premium, one year later, gone from 4.37% to 6.43%. There's your answer. How much can they change? Got the answer. That's why since September of 2008, I've taken to doing the implied equity risk premiums at the start of every month because I got the message, right? Premiums can change a lot. You can't stay with the same premium through the course of an entire year. And almost all of that change in 2008 happened in the, in the 12 weeks between September 12th, which was the Friday before the Lehman collapse, to December 31st. In fact, during that period, I tortured myself at the start of every day. As I was coming in on the train, I'd compute the implied equity risk premium at the start of that day. And actually, some days I do it in the middle of the day, in the end of the day. And there were days where I, you know, people, if you were in the market then, most of you might not have been, you'd have a 1,000-point move in the market over the course of a day. The market would go up 800 points by the middle of the day and drop another 1,800 points by the end of the day. It was kind of scary. But you could see the equity risk premiums gyrating. 
which is the definition of a crisis. The price of risk is what you will see the crisis play out. In fact, there was a day in November of 2008. This might have been the absolute bottom of the crisis, where the implied equity risk premium in the US hit 8%. It had doubled in the course of almost two months. That's what made that crisis so scary, because in most crises, there's a safe harbor you can go to, right? So when you have an emerging market going to crisis, you say, oh, I'll take my money and take it to the US. Take it. There was no place to go, because what you saw happening in the US, you were seeing happening in Europe, you were seeing happening in Asia, you were seeing, there was no place to go. So you can see how much risk premiums can change and why we need to stay dynamic. So here's what the updated numbers look like, January 2016. You got an even more updated number as of today. But at the start of 2016, the S&P 500 was at 2,043.94. So where are we right now? Do you remember what, what, uh, what we saw for? It's 2,039.76. We're at pretty much where we started the year at. So why are we all freaking out as if the world has ended and the market's gone into a complete collapse? You'd think by reading the news that we've had this incredibly eventful year where stocks have dropped 25 percent, have risen 20, they pretty much run in place. Not a great thing to do if you're an investor, but I'd much rather that they run in place than do what they did in 2008, where they dropped 40 percent. The start of the year, 2043.94, the T-bond rate was 2.27 percent, and the implied equity risk premium at the start of the year was 6.12 percent. So same process, I won't bore you by repeating the process. But the one troubling thing about the 2008 numbers is US companies were returning 106.09 to their investors. That's not, the number's not the troubling part, but their earnings for US companies last year was 104. Collectively, US companies were returning more cash than they had as earnings. And in this approach, I'm essentially as assuming they can keep doing it. That was the one thing that scared me at the start of 2016 is, unlike previous years where the cash flows were being returned out of earnings, but they were 70, 80 percent of earnings, now we're at more than 100 percent of earnings. And most of it is taking the form of buybacks. There's a cash flow problem embedded here that I haven't dealt with in this risk premium. We'll talk about a way to deal with it, but essentially that's where the risk premium is coming from. Risk premium today, because I'm using the same approach as 6.14%. Again, we've kind of come back to where we were at the start of the year. It actually climbed as high as 6.6% .6 in February because we had that crisis month where bad things were happening, but we've kind of navigated our way back to where we started the year. Now, if you're looking at the 6.12% and saying, well, well, is that a high number? Is that a low number? Let's get some perspective. Okay. If you go back all the way to 1960 and you graph out the implied equity risk premium for the US going back to 1960, this is what US stocks have looked like for the last 60 years. There are the 1960s. 1960s, the US was the global economy. It was a 50% of the global economy incredibly stable period for equity risk premiums. They range between three and three and a half percent. Then you get to the 1970s. Notice something happened? Risk premiums are shooting through the roof. Again, let me pause right there. As risk premiums are climbing, what's happening to stock prices? They have to go down. In fact, in 1977, the Dow was at 750. Three numbers in the Dow. Yeah, kind of scary, right? And in fact, Business Week ran that headline, stocks are dead. Everybody's convinced that this was the end. And of course, that was exactly the time you wanted to buy stocks because starting in 1978, going through 1999, you had one of the great bull markets of all time. With a little blip here and there, but over that period, you can see what's happening to equity risk premiums. End of 1999, the implied equity risk premium in the US was 2%. Now let me ask you a question. If you're an investor and I came to you and said, look, I'll offer you 2% more than the risk-free rate to put all your money in stocks, would you be okay with that or do you think that's too low, too high, what do you think? 
stocks are pretty risky, right? And I'm offering you 2% more than the risk free rate. He's saying, that's not enough. That's the definition of a bubble, is when you tell me that 2% is not enough, but put all your money in stocks anyway, which is what people were doing at the end of 99. You're essentially telling me one thing about what you'd like to make, but then you're paying something else. Something's got to give, and that something is going to be stock prices. And there's the bursting of the dot-com bubble. The equity risk premium climbed back to 4% in two years, and it stayed around 4% till the start of 2008, the 4.37%. And then you had the crisis. And since the crisis, the one constant is that equity risk premiums have become much more volatile. And for somebody who says, well, once the crisis ends, we're going to go back, the crisis will never end. This is the way the world is going to be, because this, to me, is one of those unpleasant side effects of globalization. You see why? Because now, when you think about equity risk, every, anything bad happening in any country feeds into your equity risk, right? So there's good stuff that comes out of globalization, but one of the bad things that comes out of it is risk premiums around the globe have become much more volatile. They've also lost that correlation with how well or badly the economy is doing in that country. It used to be that stock markets in each country reflected that country's economy. They no longer do. In fact, if you look at 2009, 2010, and, and you go through time, and you look at the S&P 500, the US economy was doing badly, but the S&P 500 was doing pretty well. And people couldn't understand that. But the reality is 60% of the revenues for S&P 500 companies come from outside the US. We have global companies that happen to be incorporated in countries. Increasingly, there's going to be a disconnect between how countries' economies are doing and how markets in those countries might end up doing. So Europe might be a basket case as an economy. But don't do something stupid like sell short on all European stocks, because the stocks you might be selling short on might be the Siemens of the world, which are really global companies that happen to be incorporated and traded in Germany. So you can get disconnects between how economies are doing and how stock markets in those economies are doing. Now, one of the questions you often hear is, are we in a bubble, right? What did I define as a bubble? Is when the implied premium is a low number relative to what you would need to make. There's something in your gut that says, I need to make this for investing in stocks. 1999 was obviously a bubble. It was obviously a bubble because I could look at the equity risk premium and say, who would be crazy enough to invest in stocks with a 2% equity risk premium? Then I looked around, and everybody was. Are we in a bubble now? What's the equity risk premium? If you, if you, now to the extent that you trust my numbers, it's about 6%. Even if you play with those numbers, it might be 5 What's the question I'm asking? Is that a really low number? And relative to at least US market history, 5 to 6% risk premiums are at the higher end of the spectrum, not the lower end. So for better or worse, when people use the word bubbles with US stocks, and that's why I, you know, I, I don't buy into the Schiller Cape and all those other short-term metrics that people can use, say, hey, stocks are overvalued because the Cape is 25. Cape might be 25, but I'm looking at the equity risk premium. It reflects the risk-free rate in your choices, and it looks like it's not 1999 to me. So if you're going to give me a bubble story, it better be based on something more than hey, the PE ratios are really high because it's not sufficient to carry the day. Yes? If it's a debt bubble, it has to ultimately show up where? The cash flows. It's a cash flow, and that's why I said my biggest concern is a cash flow concern. Because my 6% premium is based on that 106 cash flow from last year. 60% of that came from buybacks. If there's a debt bubble, guess what's going to happen? That 60 could very quickly dissipate, right? It could become. So if you're con if you so the bubble story you have to tell me then has to be a cash flow story. So make it a well-constructed story. And you then have to show me that US companies are, in fact, more heavily indebted and have much lower EBITDA relative to debt payments. And I've looked at those metrics, and the debt bubble story is a sector story. There are some sectors where that's true, but across the market, the debt story doesn't hold up as well. So there's lots of stories being told, but the best way to test them out is bring them into that, you know, by, bring, by looking at everything that you have in front of you. Yes? Yes? 
In fact, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do next is I'm going to deal with what I think is the weakest link in what I did at the start of this year, which was I took the cash flow from the trailing 12 months and then acted like you could grow those cash flows at the same rate as earnings. But I also told you those cash flows are higher than earnings. And you're saying, how the hell are you going to do that? I agree, that's going to be a problem. So here's what I did. And in fact, this is built into that implied premium spreadsheet if you want to use this. I said, look, I know the cash flow right now is 101.54% of earnings. You can't keep returning more than your earnings every year in perpetuity. I think that payout, the cash payout is going to come down. And I had to make a decision of how much it's going to pay down, come down to. So here's what I did. I took my growth rate beyond year five, which I've estimated to be 2.27%. I took the return in equity in US stocks, which is 14%. And there's actually an algebraic equation that ties the two together. To grow at 2% a year with a 14% return in equity, I can afford to pay out only 84% of my earnings in cash flows. That sounds like a really high number. With the 2% growth rate, that's all I need. I mean, that's what I can afford to pay out. That's actually pretty close to the payout ratio over the last 10 years of cash paid out as a percentage of total income. So in this approach, what I've done is rather than keep the cash flow fixed at what it was last year and let it grow at the same rate as earnings, I'm actually letting the earnings grow at the 5%, but I'm letting the payout ratio adjust over time to what I think is a more sustainable number, which effectively brings down the cash flows. And with those lower cash flows, when I solve for my expected return, I get a much lower expected return of 7.43%, and my equity risk premium, instead of being 6.12%, is 5.16%. But you know what I'm happy it's not? I'm happy it's not 2%. If it were 2%, then I'd be freaking out. And I might end up freaking out anyway. But to me, the basis for this argument of stocks are overvalued, I think, as long as my alternative is putting my money in something risk-free and earning 1.69%, stocks are not overvalued relative to that alternative choice. So it's, there are possible combinations that can get us into trouble, but lots of different things have to fall into place for that combination to hold. Yes? Absolutely. Equity risk premium is your receptacle for all your hopes, all your worries, and all your fears, right? Because in a sense, if, you're, if you get more optimistic about the future and you push up your growth and cash flows, you're going to see equity risk premiums come down. You get more scared about China melting down, your equity risk premium is going to go up. That's why that number will reflect everything that's happening around you. It's a one single number that captures the entire market. Everything else, you're going to get a piece of the puzzle. The equity risk premium gives you the, the net effect of all those hopes and fears and how they're playing out. And this year, there have been lots of hopes and lots of fears. But nine months into the process, they washed each other out. Will that stay the same for the remaining four months? I have no idea. But every day when I open up the paper and I look at what's happened in the market, I try to avoid reading what they tell me happened in the market. right? Because remember that Friday, it was all because of, how can that be? How can you suddenly wake up on a Friday morning and say the Fed's going to raise rates today? When in fact, this has been the story for the last 11 months. People fit stories after the fact to explain what's happened. So sometimes it's better to step back and, and get the perspective, looking at the entire picture. Because on any individual day when you see that big a movement, it's got nothing to do with fundamentals. It's fear, right? Fear of feeding on itself. And fear of feeding on itself is just the definition of equity risk premiums increasing dramatically that day. Yes? I'll tell you when it's problematic. The implied equity risk premium is high, and earnings growth turns out to be much lower than expected. You're going to have some, some, some. You know, at the, at the end of the process, you're going to look back and say, "I wish I hadn't done that." So growth is an input, risk is an input, cash flows are an input, the risk-free rate is an input. So that's why everything you have in here is going to play out. But think about it: well, if growth is lower, right? What else is going to change? 
the risk free rate might go to 1.2%. That's why it's so difficult to isolate one factor. So what will happen to my equity risk premium if that happens? I've got to think through the consequences of everything else. And this is what I think central banks miss is they think by lowering the risk free rate, they can keep everything else fixed, right? Your expected growth in earnings, your risk premium. But when they lower risk free rates, you're an investor, what do you do? You, in your mind, it's like game theory. You kind of reorient all your numbers and they say, these central banks must be seeing some really bad stuff. They're lowering the risk free rate below zero, so I'm gonna raise my risk premium, lower my earnings growth, and the net effect is, you see stock prices actually drop after the central bank is. And if you remember the definition of insanity I gave you last week, take a look at what the Japanese central bank has announced it's going to do today. And you're going to see the definition of certifiable insane. You think that the Japanese central bank, which has the longest experience being insane, because they've been doing this for 25 years, right? Since 1991, they're saying, we're going to fix the Japanese economy by lowering rates. How well has that worked out for you? And you keep trying. And now they've made it policy for the next 10 years. Thank you for letting me know. But it's, again, part of the process of focusing on one variable and not thinking about everything else in the puzzle that has changed. So I'm going to complete this story by showing you what I think are some interesting facts over time. So since I've been estimating this implied forward-looking equity risk premium, one of the questions I've always been interested in, as risk-free rates change, does it affect the implied equity risk premium? In other words, in the 1970s, remember the, six, the premium was 6.5% in 1978? But the T-bond rate then was 10%. You see why, why that makes a difference? At a 10% risk free rate, you're going to say, I'm going to demand a larger risk premium simply because everything's been scaled up. A 6.5% risk premium when the risk free rate is 2% is a lot scarier than a 6.5% premium when the risk free rate is 10%. So in this graph, you actually see the two. And what you've really seen is until 2008, risk-free rates and equity risk premiums tended to move together. When risk-free rates went down, risk premiums went down. When risk-free rates went up, risk premiums went down. Since 2008, that relationship has broken down. This week's weekly challenge, I'm going to send you my entire data set, 1960 to 2015 implied equity risk premiums. I'm going to give you the risk-free rate. And I'm going to give you a couple of other columns. And what I want you to do is explore the data. Does the risk premium change as risk free rates change? Does the risk premium change when, my, when corporate bond spreads change? Look at the relationship to see if there's something you can get out of it that might help you make a better judgment. It's almost impossible graph to read, but I'll try. One of, the, one of the things that's happening in markets increasingly is we live in silos. You know what I mean by silos? Think about the job you're interviewing for already have accepted after your summer internship. You're going to be in equities, you're going to be in fixed income, you're going to be in real estate. Your future, in a sense, is going to be in that place. You're saying, so what? You will talk to other people who deal just with equities, you will eat lunch with other people who deal just with equities. In fact, after a while, your echo chamber will be people in the equity market and a subset of the equity market. Maybe you're in US equities, Latin American equities. You're going to live in that echo chamber. You're going to fixed income, you're going to end up in a different echo chamber, and you're going to talk to each other. And there's very little conversation across markets. So one of the things I've tried to explore for the last few years, especially since 2008, is, is can I look at other markets to see if I can learn something about equity markets? So the first place I went was to the bond market, because there is an equivalent of an equity risk premium in the bond market, and it takes the form of a default spread, right? What you charge over and above the risk free rate. In fact, it's far easier in the bond market. I can observe the spread. So I decided to pick a bond. I don't want to go to the high yield market because I don't have as much history. I picked a BAA rated bond. And actually, it wasn't accidental. BAA rated bond I picked because the Federal Reserve data set, the data set, Fred, actually has the spreads on a BAA rated bond going back to 1929 or 1927. I can look back at the spreads. I went back to 1960. And each year, here's what I did. See this? black line, that's actually the spread on a BAA rated bond. So I'm keeping the rating fixed and looking at how much the spread changes over time. You see, what does that tell me? When that spread goes up, default spreads in the bond market are increasing. Bond investors are getting more scared. They're charging a higher spread. 
And I superimposed the equity risk premium on that same graph. What I was trying to figure out is when bond investors get terrified, are equity investors also getting terrified? When Thank you. 
yourself from the game to get that. So th what you see in that this column is a ratio of acquisitions in the bond. I'm sorry, a ratio of acquisitions to bond deposit. Historically, that number has been about six. Yeah. So then, how did you get my play? Was playing in more than two days. Go look up the DAA default there from the Federal Reserve Fed Market Fund or two. You might be pretty close to the actual number you need to make, which you can check history with that ratio of default Any questions? Um, so you can try high yield. I haven't tried this with the high yield spread because I don't have it in my trade history. But you can check if you add on a high yield spread market. Maybe there's a disconnect between the high yield market and the investment grade market. The investment grade market is the equity market. And by putting all three acquisitions in one place, So when real estate developers talk about cap rate, they talk about the expenses. So the way this manifests is that you ask for the value of property, you take the earnings from the property, and you divide by the cap rate. It's like a perpetual growth model. This is beautiful. Why are we taking the earnings? So the cap rate is expected to turn as real estate is at the investment value of the So do I subtract out the risk-free rate from that? I'm getting a risk-premium return for real estate. So who tells me, for instance, that the cap rate is 6%? And the risk free rate is 1.69%. So risk premium in real estate is 6 minus 1.69, which is 4.31. So here's what I've done with this graph. This is kind of overkill, but can I handle that? I took the equity risk premium from the previous graph. I took the DAA default rate from the previous graph. And then I threw in this risk premium from real estate that I got by subtracting out the risk free rate from the cap rate. And that was what I got. Take a look at that real estate. In the 1980s, in fact, all the way through the start of the 90s, what do you notice about that risk premium? It's just been negative. People in real estate seem to be settling for the farm return because we're lower than the risk premium. And I think mean, that is so absurd. That's crazy. So let's not do rocket talk here. <laughs> but then when we have to have rational explanation for this, and this goes back to how I would start investing way back in 1979, 81. I was told. That real estate is a good investment to make for a, for a person who wants to diversify. Right? The argument being that if your money is in stocks and bonds, then adding real estate kind of gives you some value in that regard. And that was based on the experience in the 1970s, which was when that inflation came <coughs> strong, that real estate actually did well as a market. So we were all taught this lesson about What's wrong with real estate? It's lumpy, right? You know what I mean by lumpy? In the 1980s, in order to buy real estate, you had to buy a house. You had to buy an apartment. That took too much money. And hence was born the start of real estate to feel like this. And then REITs, the REITs were, you know, sort of very small slices. So you had very safe to get Now the REITs are not because people are diversified. And this is, I think, another problem with markets. You make it easy for people to buy slices of other asset classes. Over time, guess what starts happening to those other asset classes? They start to behave like stocks and bonds. And in fact, by the time we get to the 1990s, notice that the real estate risk premium now is starting to behave like the equity risk premium in the bond itself. In fact, remember that period of history, 2002 to 2007, when bond defaults were decreasing and risk premiums were staying high? Look at what happened to real estate risk premiums during that same period. So you now have two things coming together. You've got default spreads in the bond market dropping to historic lows, and you've got the risk premiums in real estate being pushed down to historic lows. What you had to have of the 2008 crisis? Real estate risk premiums become too low, guess what's going to happen? At some point in time, people are going to wake up and say, I'm not making much money on real estate as much as I should be. I've got to adjust the price down. And that's going to cause some difficulty. So my theory is start thinking about different markets. Don't think of risk premiums. Risk premiums is the equity market. That is risk premium in every 
And as an investor, you have choices. You can invest in stocks, you can invest in bonds, you can invest in real estate, you can invest in whatever. You just have to make sure that risk return trade-off for gain is right. And that might mean investing in our asset allocation, which is to get the best for us. Thank you. 
So what I did in this graph is I actually took three, it's four measures of equidistant. So first is the parity criterion. So if you can meet the parity criterion, you can actually predict that you're going to the next five years in most cases. The second one was I took the average of five two over the last five years, so even if you ignore the number, that's the end of the average. Third vertical is sorry, the mean is sorry, that's what I was predicting, and that's what I should make. And the fourth was I took the default to the month that I took a very simplistic number. <laughs> Correlated each number was with returns over the next five years, <coughs> the next year, and the next decade. If you have a risk free mean that works, so if you want a positive correlation or a negative correlation, <coughs> you want a correlation. Sorry, you want the correlation to be positive and as close to one as you can because then you will be the perfect measure of actual return. Bad news, none of these have a perfect correlation, but I didn't get close to any of them. Let's take across the form, which was the, so let's get rid of the worst possible way of estimating the first one. You want a positive correlation, you definitely don't want a negative correlation. The worst possible way to estimate historical risk is by far, it's not even a contest. Which means it's false. You get a negative correlation, which means that whatever the historical risk is, you actually use a high number, and you use a high number, and just like Teddy was saying, I wish I had an answer. Among the three approaches, I was surprised when I found this. What the, it says the term next year, the time is not changing. It's actually moved back. But it looks forward 10 years, average of having 5 premium over the last 5 years gives me a much better proxy for the back year. So the 6.13% that I showed you was the primary criteria. The average over the last 5 years has been closer to 5.5%. So you, the first exercise that you have to use a number that I actually took a concept of that, maybe I'll average out over the last five years, but again, the entire premium consistently is a historical premium. And even at the fourth phrase, uh, times two, is the historical premium on a, uh, on a <coughs> So nothing is perfect, because 10 years again, the stock market history is really not that long. But you can always see that some premium is worth better than others. Now one of the advantages of these implied premiums is I can do this every month. Because I, unlike if you know historical things, where I need a lot of data, what was time in the previous time my last year, all I need to get the implied premium for a specific market is the level of the index today. I took cash flows last year and it expected growth. That was the numbers. You can see all your proofs of given in 2011. So in, in 2007, for instance, I applied this as a sensor. I didn't have to read that. So I took the level of the index. I took the dividends, and there are very few buybacks, which actually is even easier if you actually know how to do that job. I took my growth rate, and I had to cheat a little bit, because unlike the S&P 500, where all these people estimating the expected growth for the next five years, in most emerging market indices, you don't have that piece of data. Right? So I did the best I could with the ADR, which was growth rate. And I thought for a few minutes I did it. So I did exactly what I did with the S&P 500 using the sensor, and I get 11.18. I did everything in, US, uh, in, in the European terms. I subtracted out the yield in the two years previous then, 6.76%, and applied that data to the month of earnings in 2007. So 4.13. Do you get a high number or a low number? You know, if I, if I have my brothers and I can blend these things, Markets are consistent in five premiums for every group we get. If I'm a global portfolio manager, what do I need to do then? Once I have this implied premium, how does it apply my investment plan? I want to go to those countries with high implied premiums or low implied premiums. I want to go to those countries that have the highest implied premiums. And that's why I'm making a big assumption about I'm away from those countries with low implied premiums. Because another way of thinking about Across markets is a way of you know, looking at those countries. Looking at those countries. And incidentally, for Brazil, which is the one country where I've done implied equity risk premiums every year for the last 15 years, you can see the kind of ebb and flow of the. So Brazil has gone through a phase where it became almost a developed market in 2010, where it went back to being an emerging market. 
starting in 2000, we did really good in those months. The guy came in at 4 pay, which is almost 4.06% higher than the U.S. premium, becoming almost non-existent. By the time we get to 2010, the implied premium in Brazil and the implied premium in the U.S. are almost converged, and now we're back to the growth rate. It's an interesting way of thinking about how markets play for this country. And perhaps we need lessons for the money. I'll close off with one final table. And this is actually a table that you can take a look at and yourself. What I've been trying to do for the last few years, I hope, is pursue the implied premium for emerging markets collectively versus the implied premium for developed markets. I want to see how much a market is starting to lose to invest by giving me as a percent to invest on my money. <laughs> that is how much higher the implied equity risk premium is in the emerging market value of the development market. In 2004, that number was 3.35 percent. If I put my money in emerging markets, I was rewarded with a premium 3.35 percent higher than the U.S. That's emerging markets. By the time I get to 2012, look at that number it's down to 435 percent. Collectively, I'm getting almost the same equity risk premium in emerging markets as I am in developed markets. And of course, you have the stories, right? There's, there's convergence, emerging markets are becoming more and more developed markets, which is more and more and more. And you can see the rise of this. What you see for the last four years is a little bit of a reduction of that in the market. That's in 2012. Where we are now, we're now 2015. And you are getting some emerging flows which is in this market. So I'll tell you the equity risk premium Right? 
So but if the market goes low, but let's say, let's take the worst case scenario. Let's say the market drops by 50 percent. Is it cheap? Yeah. What is called short drop by 80 percent? No, no, wait. Major version is a belief. It's not a, it's not a fact. In the U.S., you know what? If you're taking a more successful equity market, of course you're going to get major version. That's like taking a, a, a baseball player with a 300 lifetime average, like Jesus. And so no, every time... It's a danger to say that something will happen that's never happened before. This is a danger to think of this too far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's the problem. It's a yeah. textbook proposition, right? Are you labeled like a broker? Is that a small... I'm an agnostic. I am not yeah. a broker investor. I'm, I'm buying it at the right price. In fact, what I did with the public okay. take was I actually took... So that's the 